I've chosen to do this is ridiculous. <laughs> You're amazing. That is amazing. Like, <laughs> like I used to do cold calling for a living, so I have no fear. <laughs> I guess. I, That's, <laughs> I think cold, cold calling is my version of hell. Oh, see, I love it. I get excited about it. Right, apparently, apparently we are live. So I'm going to test this uh, with, with my oh so fancy uh, phone and check that we are actually live. And if anybody is live, please can you throw us some comments so that I know because we all know that I have this problem when I stream from Zoom. I never know when I'm live and then I'm like talking for about 10 minutes and everyone's like, we know you're there, you loser. <laughs> <laughs> we know you're there, but we can't see you. Okay, so here we go. You'll hear me in a second. <laughs> the delay is also also like bizarre. So here we go. I can invite... I'm looking everybody cool. i know well the great thing is that loads of people were like oh yeah we really want to see this one so we have three people who are already viewing yay thanks guys hey tina ah thank you for putting up a comment right guys i'm doing the usual fancy thing i've got my phone doing the comments because you know zoom and also just with technology blows um so if <laughs> If you can hear us, let us know. If at any point you can't hear us or you hear a bang, that is my phone falling off of my laptop. All right, so nobody panic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've got Tina, we've got Julie, Vanadine, we've got Emma. Scott is here. Everybody would wave to you, but obviously they can't wave. So imagine them waving. Um, if you are here and you know that there is somebody else who is supposed to be watching this with us today, please um, share it with them and you know tag them in the comments because I know there are quite a few people who are really interested in this one today I'm really excited about it um so just before we kind of get started I want to put in some little caveats here firstly Scott is officially now like the only guy in a group of 1900 women so give him a break right he's <laughs> be gentle he's also no little, pressure yeah a little bit a little bit nervous about this because there are 1900 of you and only one of him and so that's always a little bit a little bit nerve-wracking right so if we can throw up some hand hearts and all the, the preachy what's it that I never really get there no, everyone's waving at you in, in the comments it's really nice <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so Scott is and I, I'll give you like the lowdown really Scott is the genius behind um the brand new smart leader cell podcast <laughs> Tina saying poor man there we go. <laughs> um, but Scott's the genius behind the Smart Leader Cell podcast. And, you know, when I always come in here and I talk to you guys and I say, ultimately, sometimes it comes down to hiring the experts. We all know how technologically challenged I am. Technology is not my strong point. However, one day when I was asking for recommendations about podcasting, someone mentioned Scott's name and they were like, seriously, he's great. You need to go and talk to him. And I did. And I went and had a chat with Scott. and He's amazing you are amazing. Um, and he basically helped me map out my entire podcast. He helped me do all of the um, initial planning stages, helped me with the launch. He produces it. He does all of the editing for it. He writes all the show notes for it. Basically, I'm the laziest person on the planet right now. <laughs> when it comes to my podcast, I'm like, I don't really do anything other than talk. Awkward. <laughs> um, and that, that's kind of what I do anyway. So, he is the the man, the myth, the legend behind the new podcast. And he's really, really kindly agreed to come in here today and talk about podcasting and talk about who should have a podcast. Because let's face it, actually, some some people shouldn't. Um, you know, if you're really antisocial, probably don't, don't get a podcast. Or maybe do, because you don't have to talk to anyone, really. <laughs> I can just sit here and talk to myself. Um, He's also going to talk to us about what you should be doing and the kind of things that are good in the podcasting world and the kind of things that are bad. Now, I've learned a ton from Scott in the last couple of weeks alone. Um, he's taught me some things I never, ever knew about the magical world of podcasting. But seriously, big props because he is in here and he is giving up his time. So <laughs> Tina's saying you look mortified by the compliments. <laughs> I don't take them well. <laughs> okay, we'll just give you some more and you'll be back. You're welcome. Welcome to the Smart Leader Sales Society. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's very nice to to be here. <laughs> um, you've definitely created a lot of hype to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about it. It's, uh, it's one of those things. I've rocked up with no makeup and legitimately, ladies, it's five o'clock, like it's five past five here. So I, I've done what every single woman does at five past five. And I'm like, bra is off, 
makeup is off. I am done for today. Apart from I, this I, I did that too. Did I you? did that too. So, and it, it, it's only 1 p.m. here. So I really called it in early. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> that, that's, that's it, right? <laughs> All of us <laughs> are bras off and we're ready to go. So Scott, tell us about, you know, podcasting and kind of what's the point in a podcast or of a podcast? Okay, so that is a fairly loaded question, but I guess the easiest way to explain it is that a podcast serves the same purpose that a blog or a YouTube channel would serve. It's a medium for you to get your message out to an audience. Mm -hmm. The reason why podcasting is taking to the forefront right now in terms of popularity very quickly is that Last time I checked, which was probably a couple of months ago, by the way, I talk with my hands a lot. Um, <laughs> you, you'll see that. Um, the last time I checked, which was probably a couple of months ago, blogs outnumbered podcasts roughly 2,000 to 1. Yeah. YouTube channels are around the, a, a similar uh, quota or, or ratio, I guess I'm trying to say. Which means that just based on supply and demand alone, podcasting is very valuable because not everyone is doing it. So it's a really, if you do have a blog, it's a great way to support your blog. If you do have a YouTube channel, it's a great way to repurpose the audio from your videos and put it in a medium that is quickly growing, but still has kind of a chance to break out ahead of the copious millions of bloggers out there. Last I checked, there was only 250,000 live podcasts versus the millions of blogs so and I love how we say that you're like oh there's only 250,000 uh podcasts like there's yeah thousand and it's like only but when you look at all of the other media it's crazy like there are so many blogs everyone and their dog has a blog everyone and their dog has a vlog or a youtube channel even I have a youtube channel right <laughs> I'm like Go check it out, maybe. Uh, but also, it's, it's one of those things that podcasts have recently really come to the fore. I mean, Gary V has been talking about podcasts, right? He's been saying that podcasts are the new big thing. Why is that? I mean, obviously, we have the 250,000 thing. Yeah. But- well, 250,000 seems like a big number until you break it down. How many of those are comedy? How many of those are business? How many of those are special interests like pets or, you know, what have you? By the time you start carving out the 250,000 into the niches and realms and genres they belong to, you actually find that you only have a handful. Oh, I'm like, sorry, on Ontario is calling. Um, (laughs) You find you only have a handful of, of any given genre, any given you know, subject. So just that alone means that if, if like yourself, you know, sales or like myself, I know podcasting, we can get in and maybe only stand against a handful of people versus the huge amounts of people. Like if you wanted to start a blog about sales, your competition is stiff, you know? So, and where podcasting, in my opinion, fits in, I call it a passive intake medium. Whereas blogs, you have to read. Books, you have to read. YouTube videos and things like that, you have to focus on the video. They take your eyesight. They take, you know, you can't read a book while you're driving. If you can, um, kudos, but however you figured that out was, was horrible. Don't ever do that again. You can't watch a YouTube video while you're driving. You know, whereas a podcast, you can, you can put in a podcast during your commute, you can listen to a podcast while you're doing dishes, you know, so as a passive intake medium, you can even listen to them while you're sleeping. You know, you, you kind of laugh about those people who learn languages in their sleep. Podcasting can be, you can put those earbuds in and listen. So just from a accessibility and a competition standpoint, podcasting is a really big deal right now. I love that. And I think it's it's really interesting because I genuinely didn't realize how time starved I was until I started a podcast, right? And embarrassingly, okay, uh, this is where you get to see how sort of vain I really am, guys. Um, <clears throat> embarrassingly, 
I cannot watch any of my live streams back because I'm always like, oh my God, I sound like Minnie Mouse on crack and I just can't listen. I'm like, oh no. And like watching them makes me want to cry. But with a podcast, I managed to listen to like a good eight minutes of my podcast the other day when I was showing my mum how it worked. And I was like, oh, that's, that's not so bad. I sound kind of cool. So I think there is that element of actually podcasts are easier to listen to And it's easier for me to consume information in a podcast. Like you say, I can do the dishes and I can listen to Lewis Howes or whoever talking about whatever they're doing. And I can get to know interesting people. I think that's one of the best bits of podcasting is that you get to know different people. Whereas Facebook land is kind of inclusive. You only know the people whose circles you're in. You never really get exposed to anybody else, right? Well, podcasts kind of help me love people I don't know. And Facebook makes me hate the people I do. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) That's kind of the way I see it. (laughs) Amazing. So Claire has a question. And actually, guys, if you do have questions, please throw them out because this is really useful for me to, you know, be able to ask Scott. And it's also useful for you guys to get the answers. And also for Scott, right? Market research. Everyone loves a bit of that. So Claire has a question. Is it best to always do interview content with another person on a podcast? No, Um, it is a great medium. It is a great medium to do or a great, um, I guess, way to approach it. But the issue is that it, it highly depends on what your goals are. Very much depends on what your goals are. Because for audience growth, for instance, getting a guest on to grow your show is fantastic because you're tapping into different um, different audiences. You get to, to cross promote to their market. They cross promote to yours. It's great. It, it's also good to, you're, you don't have to create all the content when you interview someone, someone else will come in and tell you everything they know. And you just get to sit there and, and nod your head and, and basically say like, yes, that's wonderful. You know, tell me more about that. Oh, really? Well, I thought this. And you can kind of create a little bit of polarity with your guests and get into some discussions. I do interviews. However, the issue is it does not carve you out as an authority. It does not let people know that you know your shit. Can I swear on this? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, perfect. (laughs) Uh, When you interview people, you become a great interviewer. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I like to tell people is depending on your goal, if you want to come out as the authority and you're not too worried about, you know, fluffing up show numbers and things like that, you can get on and and just do solo content, talk what you know, pick a subject, deep dive into it, which Jess is amazing at. I love her solo stuff. It it Mm -hmm. basically doesn't feel like work when I produce her show because all this stuff is stuff that I want to learn anyway. You know, but what it does is it carves her out as a sales specialist, someone who really knows everything about sales, which is great. So a lot of people hide behind guests because they don't feel they're an authority on something or they don't think they know or they're scared to share what they know or they're even afraid to share too much, you know, information. So they'll hide behind a guest. But I feel that guests are a good way to grow your show. Yeah, they're and and they're a good way to learn new things. Again, like I when I get on podcasting experts on my show and we talk, I learn so much. But that does not show my audience what I know. And that's the really interesting thing, isn't it? Because when we come like when we look at sales and we've talked about this in this group recently, when we were talking about why you should build a Facebook group or why you should build a community, it's got to have a purpose. And I think it's really interesting that you've just said exactly that, right? having guests has got to have a purpose. There's got to be a reason to have your guests. So it's either got to add something to you, i.e. it's got to grow your audience. It's got to make your network stronger. It's got to give you some leverage. It's got to make you a better interviewer or it's got to benefit them. And ultimately, I mean, I will throw my hands up. I love being featured on other people's podcasts because like you say, I rock up. I don't really have to do that much. I can just say some stuff. It's really cool. And then people will come over to my audience if they like me. If they don't, that's cool. But ultimately it does a lot for you, credibility wise, branding and visibility wise and sales wise. Yeah, absolutely. The only thing it doesn't do, like I said, is carve out yourself as someone who knows what they're talking about. And again, 
there's different ways to do that. One thing that you do that I love is that you get guests on your show, but it isn't about what they know. It's about what they want to know. So they ask you a question and then again, you get to dive in and tell them, you know, like what, you know, it's, it's just wicked. Like it's a really good system. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I have to be honest. Credit to that obviously goes to you for being like, you should get guests on your show. And- I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and to Heather Gray, who was like, I want to see a podcast with live coaching. And I was like, I can do that. <laughs> um yeah. so there we go two of my favorite people um and heather is actually here and i so i love heather and i think you guys should get to know each other because i just you know i just think you should but heather has this wicked podcast that i obsessively listen to and that other people in here should obsessively listen to because it's great and it's called business mindset mastery now the interesting thing about it is that me and heather talked for ages about setting up a podcast right you remember before i came to you and i said i'd been to other people to like look at getting them to help my podcast and blah, blah, blah. Me and Heather have been talking about this for a long time. We were like, yeah, we want to get podcasts. We want to be the cool kids on the block. And Heather launched hers before me because she's an action taker and I'm pretty lazy. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and she launched it on Anchor. Um, and she's just typed in, I was in the middle of asking this. <laughs> um, so there we go. I've read your mind. Um, but she's launched her show on Anchor FM because she was trying to launch obviously to see whether she really wanted to be a podcaster which I think is actually really good trialing it out before you spend the money and the time and all that kind of stuff on it I thought was a brilliant idea and kind of wish that I'd done the same um but now that she's on anchor and she's getting like lots of downloads a day does it like is there any way that she can move that over to iTunes or what could she do with that because Anchor's kind of limited in that she has to record them on the day and yeah that stuff. so the way it basically works when is does Anchor does Heather know if Anchor gives an RSS feed Heather will tell you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because <laughs> In order to submit something to iTunes, to Stitcher Radio, you need to have a a dedicated link to your show, which is called an RSS feed. Um, Typically, that's generated by a host, a podcast hosting platform like Libsyn or Blueberry or something like that. It's on iTunes. So it is actually on iTunes. Okay. Okay. But she's saying she doesn't know offhand like what the RSS feed is. Okay, so basically what happens is I'll, I'll kind of paint a little bit of a picture. What happens is you record your episodes, you get them all edited and, and fancified and ready to go out to the world, and then you place them on a hosting platform. So Anchor would be uh, Heather's hosting platform. Mine is Libsyn, yours is Libsyn. Some people use Podbean, some people use Blueberry. What that does is it puts all of your content in one place to be stored and distributed. Now, iTunes is not a host. Stitcher is not a host. They're what's co- they're what are called directories. Okay. So when you put everything into your host, your host generates a link called an RSS feed. Okay. All that is is a dedicated link to your show. The purpose of it is that any changes you make to your show, if you want to change a description, a title, add a new episode, take one away, what have you, it populates within that link so that you don't have to go to each individual place and change it. So with that RSS feed, any changes you make will be populated within the RSS feed. What you do with that link is submit it to iTunes, submit it to Stitcher, submit it to Google Play, tune in iHeartRadio, radio all those places and then what happens is every time you post a new episode your rss feed updates which then distributes it to all of the places that you've submitted it so you don't have to go check seven eight nine different directories and update it yourself so that's the basic techie geeky stuff behind it <laughs> So like hers, obviously she's having to go into Anchor and she changes the description, everything there. So if she wanted to put that onto iTunes, would she just host it herself, like through Libsyn, like I'm hosting it? Um, 
I'm to be honest with you, Anchor is not something I've had a lot of experience with. I've heard a lot of people are using it because it's it's kind of a free platform. Yeah. My my opinion is that a place like Libsyn or Blueberry or what have you are the better options because you control your RSS feed. Whereas mm-hmm. places like Anchor, they control it. SoundCloud, they control it. So you are you are very limited. Personally, like Libsyn offers a service where they will migrate all your content over. I don't know the exact cost or anything like ah. that, but they, they can migrate your stuff over and then you'll have like the actual hosting platform where you get to control every detail of your show if you wanted to. I love it. See how yeah. that you go. Scott, solving your problems since 2017. You will be <laughs> able to transfer your show and you won't have to start a new one. You can go to Libsyn and they'll sort all of that out for you. And then we can all listen to it. Well, we all Although, <laughs> I, I will say starting from scratch isn't necessarily a bad idea oh. because... On iTunes, one thing you can do is, let's say you've already, you log in, you go to my podcasts, Mm -hmm. you can change the RSS feed and just submit your new one. So if there's things about your show you don't like right now, you have a chance to start clean and fresh. You can, if you have your old audio files and everything, like if you have control of your files, you can upload only the episodes you liked. You can change intros, outros, descriptions, whatever you want. Like, so sometimes starting over is not a bad thing, but if you really don't want to put in all that legwork, they can transfer everything over. I love it. I love it. See, look at that. That is why he's a genius. Heather says she looks forward to talking to you about this. So you <laughs> <go>. um, sure. <laughs> okay. So we have some other interesting questions. Guys, like I say, if you have questions, please throw them out there because it's really useful so julie dennis says hey julie um how do you choose which hosting company to go with that's actually a really interesting question yeah well there's a lot of things that factor in the main things that typically factor in is budget and statistics so if you want to approach advertisers at some point or certain big name guests you're going to need some, some statistics, some analytics or metrics to give them. So with companies like, and of course, where they're hosted is another thing. So with things like SoundCloud, it's not necessarily a podcast platform. It's more for music. And, you know, forgetting the financial hot water they may or may not be in. <laughs> um if you, even if you push that aside, they don't support podcasters and they never really will. They've been trying to make it work, but their price breakdown just doesn't make sense to be a podcaster. Mm-hmm. So the typical leaders in the podcasting space right now are Libsyn coming in at number one. Mm-hmm. Their prices are a little bit steep, but their analytics are very, very deep. Like you can tell what regions people are tuning in from. They have this beautiful little map that gets colored in. Uh, You get graphs. You can tell, like, are they accessing you from iTunes, Mozilla, Facebook? Like you can break down to everything. So if you're a a stat head like I am, if you're really into statistics, you you want to know as much about your show and, and your listenership as possible. So where Libsyn wins for me is they're worth the cost because of what they give you statistically. And also their support team is amazing. Um, the other thing yeah. about this lady is just to jump in there is that I'm using Libsyn and it's costing me $20 a month. Okay. So yeah. in, in all transparency, I'm like, it's 20 bucks a month. If podcasting mm-hmm. is something you're serious about, you know, when you are choosing a company, I, in, again, in transparency, I went with Libsyn because I said to Scott, who's the expert at this, I was like, who do I go with? And he was like, Libsyn, because this is all the stuff you can track. So ultimately you can choose whatever you want, but 20 bucks a month. If it's, if it's what the experts recommend and you're serious about podcasting, maybe go with it. There are other options. You, you said there are some other options as well, yep. which is quite cool. Blueberry and Podbean are the other options. Now, the nice part is I run a group with 1600 podcasters called the podcast discovery center. When you ask what host to go with, I'd say 75% of that 1600 scream lips in. Okay. <laughs> so unfair advantage right away. But 
Sin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of us, one of us. But <laughs> Podbean is great. It's nine dollars a month if you pay for your year up front. So, you know, you, you pay half of what you pay with Libsyn, but you get half of the statistics, you get half of the analytics. And the other thing, Libsyn, their support team is phenomenal. Like that. any problem I have with, and I, I run, I think nine shows right now for clients. If I run into a problem, they're right there with me the very next day saying like, Hey, we'll take care of that for you. I love that. Um, and so the support team in the other places, they can take a little longer. Um, it, can, it can be a little more of a process. But again, the price breakdowns are typically a little more budget friendly. But again, like you said, 20 bucks a month for the best is not, it's not like taking a bullet or anything. Yeah. So <laughs> You're not going to have to sell your firstborn child, okay? <laughs> not, yeah. not for a podcast. Okay, um, so hopefully that helped you, Julie, who said, I love stats, which absolutely of course you do <laughs> then libsyn <laughs> all the way libsyn libsyn i really the, will make that chant okay now um, there there are cheaper plans within libsyn yeah however 20 dollars a month is the minimum to get all your analytics perfect okay there we go that's a sneak peek also just as an FYI, when I had my um, sales call with Scott, I said, are you an affiliate for Libsyn? Because if you are, I'll buy through your link. And he was like, no, I just really love them. So there you go. If, if, if a guy can be that passionate about one company and they're not even an affiliate, it's a good one. Um, so the next question we have is from Matea. I hope I'm saying your name right. And also, I think this is your first live where you are actually live as I am live. So yay, welcome to your first live. We love that. Um, <laughs> she says, hi, I was 10 minutes late. So I don't know if you already covered this. How long should a podcast be? Is there an ideal length? And what should I take into consideration when deciding on the length of my podcast? Thank you both for this. It's a great question. Actually, I do love it. I do <laughs> love that question. And it's because there's a lot of mixed information about this. There are lads out there who are boasting, you know, millions of downloads a year that they do a daily show 15 minutes or less and that that's the way you do it to, to jack up your numbers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say right now, numbers are masturbation. Okay? <laughs> like, bottom line, that's all numbers are used for is your ego. Like, so just leave that. <laughs> if, if someone's approaching you saying like the best way to get numbers is unless those numbers are translating to faces, names, and people, they don't mean shit. So that's first and foremost, I just want to start saying there. So you're getting a lot of, you're getting a lot of heart and um, <laughs> I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> okay, cool. I appreciate that. Heart's back. Um, so with content what's happening right now is that people are enjoying long form content less often mm -hmm. so rather than do a daily show at 15 minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes you're best off leaving that whole week blank and dropping a show once a week for an hour or twice a week for a half an hour people are enjoying that more and I'll be the first one to say it if, if I know that some because one of my favorite shows is called just the tip Mm -hmm. funny name but it's literally a five minute tip show about podcasting the host tim gives you a five minute yeah i know it's i, I thought it was clever as hell which is why i tuned in so <laughs> he gives you a five minute actionable tip every single day to use on your show i typically wait to the end of the week and listen to them all at once <sighs> just because I don't like tuning in for five minutes a day. That's almost not even worth logging in, you know? So I'll wait till the end of the week and I'll listen to them all. You're not going to get over that, are you? <laughs> <laughs> so there is no ideal length, really. One of the things... <laughs> I'll give you a moment. <laughs> just fun. It's just the name, okay? I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm okay. I'm just going to breathe. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Just the tip though, seriously. <laughs> yeah. I used to listen to it in the shower. Like I had a waterproof <laughs> bag in the shower and a, bu a buddy of mine used to make jokes about me, you know, experiencing just the tip in the shower. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. <laughs> 
Sarah, yeah. honestly, length is important. Um, <laughs> here, here we go with jokes. Now all the innuendos are coming out. Um, <laughs> Heather has just made the same joke, so I feel validated by that. But seriously, I would have thought that people would have been with the daily stuff because I see so many people who want to tune in on the daily. And But then... I feel like content's changed. I mean, when I first started out in Facebook world, and I literally do compare podcasting to Facebook because I don't, I don't know any other place. But when I started in the Facebook world, people were like content, content every day, every day, every day. And I was just like, whoa, this is overwhelming because all I consume all day long is stuff in front of me. So it's really interesting. You're like, oh, actually the best format is to do one long form or like two kind of medium length shows rather than doing the everyday stuff. Well, and I would be with you on that if the numbers didn't speak for it. Like my, I do small little bonus segments every week on top of my hour long show, like episodes. Um, And the bonus episodes get a third or a quarter. And even though they're, they're actionable tips, they're way more in depth. I like deep dive into different things. I get producers on to teach tricks and tips and all of that. People would rather listen to someone talk shit for an hour than learn something in 15 minutes. It's the weirdest thing, but it's that long form content. And what I'm finding is that when you do have a guest on or you are doing your solo show, your ideal length is as long as it's interesting. So if you get a guest on who, let's say you commit to doing a 45 minute long show. And you get a guest on and after 45 minutes, your mind is blown. They're still talking and you just, you don't want them to stop. Don't stop them. Let them go for the hour or the hour and five minutes, as long as it's relevant and it's good content and you know, your audience is just going to salivate for it. Give it to them. But if you get that guest on and they're like, you're bored after 15 minutes end it have a 20 minute episode because you're not doing your audience any justice by dragging it on for the full 45. I love that. And I think it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? Right. We identify with interesting people. If your guests are not interesting, don't interview them. If you are not interesting, don't get a podcast. That was really harsh, but I stand by it. Okay. Yeah. Um, Seriously. When you have a podcast, one of the weirdest things that I found was that you don't get real time feedback. When I'm recording my podcast, I don't get anyone saying, Hey Jess, that comment was crap. Or, you know, Hey Jess, I don't, I don't think that that's right. Or, Hey Jess, you know, what about this? And <clears throat> so actually it's quite hard because one of the things you are doing is literally talking to yourself. Now, if you're like me and you find that kind of creepy and weird, you can get a dog. I have Max. He sits in front of me. I record the podcast. Like it's all good. I feel like I'm talking to somebody, but <clears throat> It is, it is one of those things you've got to be able to keep yourself entertained if you're going to do a solo show for a little while. You know, that's just going to throw that out there. When I do my solo episodes, uh, my cousin is just starting his podcast, just starting. And he's doing it for pure entertainment, but he's literally starting from ground zero. He knows nothing. So when I form my content and I do a solo show, I pretend I'm talking to him face to face and telling him everything I need to know. Or he needs to know. So that's part. And there's a couple of reasons why I do that. One is because there's a lot in this industry I take for granted. Mm -hmm. So it forces me to go back and start from square one and explain over explain things as if he's four, you know, but the other part of it too, is that a lot of podcasters make the mistake of thinking that it's a Facebook live in, or, you know, what have you, or worse, I hate the podcasters who think they're on a stage doing like a TEDx talk. (laughs) Okay. Um, You are talking to one person. See these? Your podcast is going into the ear of one person. So you need to frame your podcast as if you were talking to one person. Even if millions of people are downloading it, each one of those millions is an individual who is listening to you on their own time by themselves in the middle of their head. So the more you can connect to that single person and make them feel like you're talking to them, use things like you, your, not you guys, everyone, you know, like keep things individualized and you'll have much more of a connection with the listener. And so, 
that's why I like to pretend I'm talking to one single person that I know needs the information. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Bernadine is saying, can we get a link to your group, please? I have a client who wants to podcast. Yes, you can. Scott will come in and he'll put a link in the comments for you. you Absolutely. Go. We'll get fancy. Absolutely. We'll get fancy. Um, <laughs> Heather has a great question. So as we're all business owners, we are going to be looking into the business podcast category, I imagine. How do we stand out in the business podcast space when it seems like everyone is doing similar things? Ooh, Ooh market <laughs> research. Um, I'm assuming you already know who your ideal listener is. Every single one of those podcasts has an ideal listener and they're not going to be the same whatsoever. For instance, there are probably, I'm going to at least say a hundred, if not more podcasts about podcasting. However, how I stand out is one, I'm really vulgar. Most of the people who talk about podcasting are really buttoned up, nasally people who talk about podcasting like this. And they tell you all of the tech stuff behind it, what microphones to get, you know, where to place the mic, how to fuck that. That's not my style, (laughs) right? Like I literally get in podcasters who have either been doing this six months or more, 20 years or more, and we shit talk the industry the stuff we don't like, what we don't see, um, the tra- it, we go trash treasures tricks. So we trash talk, then we talk about all the good stuff, and then we, we leave actionable tips to the end because it forces people to listen to the end. Um, that was my answer to hearing what has been done over and over and over again and not wanting to replicate that. So how I did that was... I went in and I listened to 10 shows that were in my category. What do I like? What do I hate? What would I do differently? Yeah. And just, and then of course thought, who do I want to help and what do they need to know? Mm -hmm. So I want to help new podcasters. I want to give them a real look and debunk a lot of the myths that other podcast gurus are spurting out. Like, you need to get a new and noteworthy and your listeners are everything. And you can start a podcast, get sponsored and live out the rest of your days fat. No. Right. So how do you best debunk those myths? Get in other podcasters and ask them, is this true? Right. So by doing that, I was able to serve my audience the best. And again, it was just, what can I do differently? Who am I trying to talk to? What do they need? I love that. And it's exactly the same with sales, right? When we talk about sales, we talk about who are we talking to? What problem are we solving for them? And what are we selling to them? You know, this is the thing. It's it's no different. And I think when we look at content as a whole, whether you're doing a podcast or a vlog or a blog or whatever, you need to be thinking, am I talking to my ideal client or am I just talking to the people I have here? Am I solving a problem for them? And ultimately, is it congruent to something I'm selling? Because if it isn't any one of those things, if any one of those things is off, it's going to be way more difficult, A, to create the content in the first place, because you're always going to be like all over the place trying to work out what to say and how to say it and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But also it's going to be way more difficult to sell. Because if your content isn't congruent, if it doesn't make sense, if you're all over the place all of the time, people don't stick with it. They don't build a relationship with you and then they don't buy. Perfect. And that's to that, to that end. And, and to further validate what you're saying is that like, I run two Facebook groups. One is called the podcast discovery center. It is thick. It is 1600 members. It's got hobbyists, business people, new people, veterans, everybody. But then I run a, a private community called podcast Bay. And that is specifically for the podcaster who's got money on the brain. Someone who wants to use their show as a marketing tool, as a sales tool, as a, you know, what have you, because I tried to do that within the PDC and I almost got chased out of there with pitchforks and fire because the artists do not want to be sold to, but they still want to refine their craft. So it's all about knowing your audience and curating the content properly. It's so funny, isn't it? I mean, I love that question, Heather, because for me, I think it's the same as when you're trying to stand out anywhere online. 
in the business space, there are so many people. And when we come into Facebook groups, when we come into online business, we're saturated. We get all the ads, we get all the Facebook communities, we get all the YouTube channels, we get all of the emails. I don't know about anybody else's inbox, but apparently everyone is going into launch mode right now because I've had like 3,000 emails this week already and it's only Thursday. And we are bombarded constantly with content that does all sound the same. Everybody uses the same sales techniques. Everybody's using FOMO. Everybody's out there talking about the same things. And ultimately, in order to stand out, one of the things that I find really, really helpful is make yourself, you know, don't go out there in a way that says, I'm trying to be really different. Go out there and stand for something, right? If you want to swear on your show because that's what you do, go for it. You know, if you like, I, w- I looked at the graphics and I, you said this to me when I started my podcast, Scott was like, look at the graphics that come up in iTunes under the business category and try and do something that stands out. Now, my team were like, okay, our colors are completely different to anything else on iTunes. Everybody else's are like yellow or red or black, or they have a really nice photo of themselves. And then they've got the name on it. It's all fancy. Ours is bright pink and teal right? And when you download it in iTunes, it's bright pink on the background because it looks very different, but it's not, it looks different because I mean, yes, I looked at iTunes. And I was like, I want it to be different, but naturally my brand is very different. I'm very pink and teal. That's the, <laughs> my, my entire house is teal. Um, <laughs> so I'm like, those are the things that are natural to me in terms of how I come across on the podcast. As you all know, it's how I show up here. It is just me. I show up, I don't wear makeup. I, you know, I, I, sometimes I wear a bra and it's great. And other times I just don't. And I'm okay with that. You know, sometimes I'm going to rock up in a hair turban and that's cool too. You know, you don't have to go out of your way to be different, but you have to take a stand for who you are. And you have to, you know, when it's something like a podcast and you have to get people to listen first to understand that you're different make your show description different, make it stand out, make your visuals different, make that stand out. Talk about stuff that you actually stand for and that you're passionate about that other people in the industry aren't saying. And that's how you're going to find it because people will share that. You know, people will be word of mouth all over it because it is different. You are different. You're saying, you know, things that nobody else is wanting to say. Does that make sense? I love that. And It's true. When I got into podcasting, I was very, very intimidated because my background, like I was a musician. I played live shows and all of that. I had a mohawk and I wore skinny jeans and, you know, um, and I worked on radio as my first job. So when I got into podcasting, my first impression of podcasting was a bunch of overweight guys in their mom's basement reviewing movies. Like I didn't realize that there was this whole podcasting with a purpose thing. So when I got in and realized that I had some experience and some knowledge, I went searching to see if anyone else had done this before. And it turns out there are people who've been doing this like since 2008, (laughs) 2004, right? People really who have been at this a long time. And I started in 2015 and I went, I don't have the tenure these people have. And I don't have the authority and the experience these people have. So what do I have? And I realized that they were all very dry. They were all very professional And I am neither of those things. I am, and none of them have a sense of humor. Yeah. So I was like, screw it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start a show. I'm going to make it as different as possible. So what did I do? I took a skull and crossbones and made a pirate themed logo and just called it podcast bakes. It was catchy. The, the intro music is like mandolin and guitar. Like it sounds like pirate, like you Yeah. And it just, it's so off the wall from what you would expect. And for perfect example, my first guest this season is a gay black podcaster from LA. And one of the things I hit him with was gay black podcaster, man, you have a lot of opportunity to educate people, but what are you up against? No one else is asking questions like that on their show. I legitimately want to know. You know, like, because for a straight white privileged male, that is a question that, you know, I don't have to face. My podcasting journey is so different from his. I don't have to deal with racism and hate mail. He does. So like, I really wanted to get in and ask him that. And that's where my show stood out is the questions I want to ask 
are so vastly different from the ones other people are asking. I love that. And I think it says a lot about you as an interviewer as well, because a lot of people would have, you know, really shied away from being like, so what's it like? You know, because that is, it's uncomfortable, right? It's, it's an uncomfortable kind of question to ask. But for those of you who are thinking about interviewing people on podcasts, you know, if you want to get the real skinny and you want to get the information that nobody else is getting, you're going to have to kind of be brave with the questions that you're putting out there and the ways that you're asking them, you know, and make people understand, make the listeners understand that you're not just there to get the same old stuff that everybody else gets. You're trying to get something for your listeners that is different, that's interesting. Yeah, I want to know what podcasters struggle with in their careers, not did you make new and noteworthy? How did you do that? What's an RSS feed? Where do you host? How do you promote? I'm like, was the community friendly with you? (laughs) <laughs> what did you you know like what 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 do you say on your show how do you how did you come up with your show like what kind of hate do you get as a result of your show do you offend people like one of the things that everyone was pointing out to me is that if I get on the mics and do what I do I'm going to offend a lot of people yeah and I'm okay with that my biggest fear is that I'm not going to offend enough people and someone who is not my kind of person is going to sneak in and, and then <laughs> We're going to have to have an ugly conversation that they're not welcome. <laughs> and this is it, right? This is the ultimate time for polarization is yes. you can't sneak in. <laughs> you people <laughs> do not come in. <laughs> you, you, you clean cut professionals have plenty of stuff for you. I'm a different human being. <laughs> All of you people who want to know about microphones, go over there. <laughs> Stand well, up. Well, no. I will still, I will still do that talk again. Like in the, in, in my communities, we do gear reviews and stuff like that every now and then. So good. It's so good. Um, so do, do, do. Oh, Matea, I'm really glad I said your name, right? And thank you for changing your like to a love. I think that was the, uh, just the tip bit, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, so Bernadine says, how important is tagging when uploading your shows? Um, tagging. Tagging is becoming, well, I can't speak for every hosting platform, but I know Libsyn is incorporating tagging within its platform. So it's becoming a dinosaur thing. You know, pretty soon you're not going to have to do it. But if your platform doesn't support um, tagging, you still will have to use an ID3 tag editor, which is just a third-party software that allows you to put title, track number, composer, you know, et cetera, et cetera, genre. It's basically to categorize things so that iTunes knows what information to pull. Again, becoming non-important, but it depends on how far behind your host platform is. There you go. So basically iTunes knows its stuff now. And and, li- and they're sharing it with Libsyn finally. <laughs> you don't have to worry. <laughs> um, Julie where do you source intro and outro music from? So actually, (sighs) there's a quick tip. tip. I sourced mine from Audio Jungle because it was really easy and I got to listen to like a thousand different tracks. If you are like me and you like 20 out of every hundred tracks, possibly give yourself some time to go through those (laughs) because it took me a while. (laughs) I agree. There's a lot of awesome sites where you can get royalty free music. However, Mm. my issue is I'm a real stickler for individuality and originality. Yeah. A lot of people go to Fiverr. Now here's the funny thing about that. One of my former clients went to Fiverr. She got an intro music done that I knew sounded familiar, but I couldn't picture where. And a couple of days ago I went to a movie and I sat down and I was watching the film and a commercial came up for a local university. That was her intro music. It was the same music used on the commercial. Oh. And I have a thing with audio. Audio imprints in my mind. If someone tells me something, a year from now, I'll remember what they said and the tone of voice they used and everything. So, like, I'll remember it. Other audio files will remember it. My answer to that was to find a band I really loved and ask them if I could use their track in exchange for credit in the show notes and to talk about it with my community and all of that. They, they gave me part of their album to, well, they gave me the whole album for free, first of all. So that was cool. And then they told me to pick any 30 seconds out of any song I wanted. 
So that was cool. And then I just had to link to their SoundCloud. So that was cool. Fast forward to when I started my new show, I told them I wanted a new song, but they didn't have anything that I really wanted because I wanted something pirate themed. Mm -hmm. The guitarist taught himself mandolin and composed my intro music for me. See, there you go. And, And this is the thing, right? relationships relationships are everything you know even Big time. When it comes to intro and outro music if you know the right people and more importantly if you're not afraid to ask and I think this is one of the big things that comes up in in and I'm going to say this right as a woman especially a woman in sales we have different things we tend not to ask for the sales often we tend to be a little bit less kind of like ooh, a bit reticent about that kind of thing But when you do ask, when you do have good relationships, when you bother to nurture those relationships and you actually do ask people to do things, it's surprising how far people go out of their way for you to make things happen. So, you know, if you do know, if you do know a band, if any of you have especially talented musical children, I was not one of those. So my parents would have really struggled. But if you do have talented musical children, get them on your podcast, get them do an intro outro. They'll love it. And it gives you something to talk about. And for that, just another thing on that note, uh, the gentleman who co-founded the PDC with me just got off the phone with a gentleman, Blake something or other. He was on American Idol. He came in second. Um, He he lost his season. That guy just contributed 80 seconds of his music to my buddy's podcast. See, you can have an American Idol finalist. Yes. So... You just have to ask. And all he wanted in exchange was tell people where they can buy my album. And there's me going to Audio Jungle. Look at that. <laughs> no shame in going to Audio Jungle. Like a lot of people, royalty free music is out there. And if you love the track you get, stick with it, love it, you know, what have you. But there are definitely more than one way or multiple ways to get the job done. So I love it. I love it. So- Same thing with your graphics. A guy from Disney designed mine. Okay. <laughs> we, we, went, we went to school together and I called him and I was like, hey, um, I need something really pirate-esque. And a lot of the graphic designers want to put my face on it. And I think that's tacky. And within a week or two, he was like, what about this? And it, I was just like, yes, that is exactly what I want. So again, see who among your friends are very talented and give them a job. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. And if anyone here works for Disney and you want to redo my, um, what's it? More than welcome. You are more than welcome. <laughs> They're technically not allowed. They sign a contract saying they can't. But as long as I don't share a name, I'm sure they can't find him and fire him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. So Heather has a question. And then what I want to do is obviously give Scott a chance to ask us some questions because it's kind of useful for him to get some market research and stuff from us. Um, so if you want to stick around for that, that'd be great. Otherwise, it'll just be me answering everything. That'll be uncomfortable. But Heather Clark has a great question, which is what are your thoughts on video podcast versus just audio? Big question. Yeah. And again, with the second you go into video podcasting, I personally feel like you're missing the point of a podcast, which is to be an audio only medium. Hmm. That being said, video is one of those things where it catches a different audience. Uh, my wife, for a perfect example, she hates podcasts. She thinks what I do for a living is kind of stupid. Just putting that out there. <laughs> okay. But she will sit down and watch eight hours of YouTube, which I think is pretty stupid. <laughs> so like, we're just, we're two different people. My mother won't listen to podcasts ever, except one time I walked in on her listening to a Gary V podcast. And I, it was like, I caught her doing something horrible. Um, I was just really impressed. She likes how vulgar he is. She loves it. Yeah. She thinks he's the funniest man. Um, she, she doesn't even have a business. She just thinks he's hilarious. And so like, she won't listen to podcasts. She doesn't watch YouTube videos, but she'll consume a book a night. Yeah. So you will reach different people. Now, what I love about video is if you start with video, you can do your video, strip the audio, repurpose it. Mm-hmm. Then you can go... I am popular today. <laughs> Not so surprised. So, yeah, you can start with video, repurpose your audio. Mm-hmm. Then if you wanted to go a step further, you could take your audio, 
plug it into YouTube or, or Rev or something like that, get it transcribed and repurpose it a step further. So video is like the top of the repurposing chain. Mm -hmm. So I think by that prospect alone, video technically is king just because you can do the job once and get it repurposed over and over again. But a video podcast for the sake of doing a video podcast, you're not going to catch your audio loving audience. So if you're going to do a video podcast, please repurpose your audio. And I think as well, you know, if you are, um, if you are somebody who finds it really difficult to record just audio, I'm, so I'm not somebody that can sit with a podcast podcast guest. I've realized this and do just audio. I have to see them on video because I can see when they're laughing. I can see when they're comfortable. I can see when they're having fun. And I think it's better relationship and better connection when it comes across on the audio. So I do all of my podcast recordings in Zoom because then I can sit opposite the person and be like, oh, this, and, and we can have a chat. And it's it's like we're in the room having a cup of tea or something. So if you are like me and you have to be able to see other people's body language and you bounce off of it, a video, a video start is a really good way, even if you are just going to repurpose the audio and use it for the podcast, if it's going to make you feel better and it's going to help you get that connection quicker and develop the rapport go for it. You know what? I, I, I'm glad you said that because I am anxious on video. Video freaks me out. Mm. I don't like doing video. I only started doing lives recently for my paid community because I'm like, screw it. They're worth it. You know? <laughs> um, but for me, when I get on video, I'm fidgety. I'm awkward. I'm weird. So audio is where I'm comfortable because I don't see that person. We're not looking at each other. I can pick my nose if I have to like that. So audio for me is where I'm comfortable. And I do, I conduct my best interviews via audio. I love that. And it's funny, we're all different. I mean, Mateo was just saying about the repurposing thing and yeah, you know, Scott is giving epic ideas there about repurposing. And if you are like super lazy, um you can also always repurpose your podcast into a blog if you want you could outsource it and get somebody to create a blog from your podcast like literally you could just create one video and break it down into a podcast into a um, blog into a mini vlog into a bunch of facebook posts if that's what you want to do so the key thing is really be be creative about your content and also produce quality content rather than tons of it you know yeah and the other thing on the repurposing front is two things one if you do get your podcast transcribed do not use them in the show notes do yeah. not put don't post the full transcription in the show notes because readers won't click to listen they will read your show notes in 15 minutes instead of listening to an hour of your show and you want them to listen that's the point but yeah. also if your content is as good as let's say jessica's you can take 30 of your episodes and transcribe them. And there is a book. <laughs> yeah. Plain and simple. <laughs> so that's the other side of it is like, if you're, you can repurpose your content into info products that you can then sell or give away as opt-ins or, you know, whatever it is you want to do. And like I said, video wins for being the top of the chain. Like you, you don't get any more interactive than that. And then you can just repurpose down the line. So I love it. I really love that. Thank you so much. Seriously, this has been like gold dust um, for us. And for anybody who wants to get in touch with Scott, please, please go and join his community. It's called the Podcast Discovery Center if you want to hang out there. Or if you want to learn how to make money from your podcast, you can go to his um, other Facebook group, which I'm in. I'm there. Um, it's called Podcast <laughs> Day. Uh, I just hang out on all of Scott's lives listening to stuff. Um, so you can also go there. But I want to invite you to ask us some questions because I know how valuable it is to get market research and you're doing some cool stuff recently. So yeah, um, I like to ask. I guess the, the two biggest questions I've been asking right now is if you want to start a podcast, what has been stopping you? Ooh. That's question one because everyone has a different take on why they haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. And that helps me to kind of figure out just what kind of fears that I either need to help people get over or need to confirm because some people's fears are very legitimate and they shouldn't be podcasting because of that, <laughs> you know? So uh, <laughs> I'm a really boring person. I have no personality. Um, so uh, there we go. If you guys have an answer to that. So, 
what is, if you want to start a podcast, but you haven't yet, what's stopping you? That's question one. So if you guys could type away, I will give you my answer. When I, um, when I was looking at starting my podcast and I hadn't, my reasons for not starting were technology. I was really, really freaked out by the fact that every time I Googled podcast, like how to start a podcast, everyone was like, oh my God, you have to have loads of different microphones and nobody really had a, you know, nobody had a a standard, hey, if you're new to podcasting, just get this microphone and just like see what it's like and then do the thing. So I was really nervous about that. Um, The technology side of it, I didn't know anything about RSS feeds. I didn't know anything about hosters. I iTunes I was like I have no idea how to upload anything to that and I spent like a good week trying to work out where the upload button was on iTunes just for a giggle so if anybody else has done that I legitimately sat there for like hours being like where's the upload button on this thing and to make it worse I will I will definitely call Sam out I said to Sam when you know before he went away I was like hey is there an upload button on iTunes and he was like yeah, you're just too stupid to find it. And I was just like, oh, okay. So I sat there for ages and it turns out there isn't one. So nobody looked for that because it's not there. Um, Other things I had was I was worried that, I was worried my audience wouldn't like podcasts. And I was like, shit, what if I start a podcast and either my audience doesn't like it or I can't get a new audience? What do I do then? Am I just going to be the podcaster that podcasts for myself? And and that was a really thing. It was like, how do I generate an audience? You know, those were my big things. Um, Julie says she's worried it'll take up too much time and that she'll run out of content. That's a really good one. Heather, I don't want to just start just because. I want to make sure the content I provide is going to be of value and not just me talking with or without a guest. Great one. That is good. Susan, definitely tech. I started on Anchor and it disappeared for a week, although Anchor was seeing it. So tech and content. Are kind of our, our things in here. If there's any more guys, please um, pop them in because it's really helpful to Scott and he's given us a ton of stuff today. Um, so we would appreciate that. If you are thinking about starting a podcast or if you have a client who's thinking about starting a podcast and you haven't yet, what is stopping you? And then you have another question. What's question two? I think I forgot it because I was starting to think of answers to all of the, the, <laughs> the fears and things that were coming up. Um, before I dive in your and, second training, that can be a second. Yeah. Training. Yeah. Come back and be like, <laughs> I will say that tech is an easy fix. Mm-hmm. There are people like me who produce shows and we geek out on it. Yeah. We can save you months of work. So that's one of the things where if tech is your issue, perhaps set a budget aside to hire, you know, someone, they don't have to be a top notch producer. They could be a student, you know, coming out of school or whatever. Although I will say typically, the value of your producer, there's the phone. <laughs> uh, the value of the producer is usually directly in proportion to what they charge. So be careful on the low, the low rates. But, you know, you can hire someone who knows all this stuff. Content, if it excites you and if it helps you, it's going to excite and help someone else. People are following you because they like you. I can go anywhere and get information on podcasting but I can't get it the way I deliver it. I can go anywhere and get sales knowledge, but I can't get it from someone like Jess unless I tune into Jess. So when you start your show, typically your first listeners are going to be the people who already love you. And then they're going to tell all their friends if the content is good enough. I love that. And Amanda, again, there mm-hmm. said consistently creating compelling content trips me up. So fun part about podcasts too. They're not live. So you can take an afternoon and batch record four shows and there's your month. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's kind of, it. as far as a time suck, it's not. The other thing actually that I've wanted to ask was, so first was, if you haven't yet, why? The other thing that I wanted to ask is what are some of the things you've heard about podcasting that has caused you to either brush it off, reconsider or that, you know, has made you want to dive in? What have you heard that has influenced your opinion of podcasting? I love that. So anything that's influenced your opinion about podcasting, anything you've heard, anything you've read, what has influenced your opinion about podcasting? So I'll give you my answer in a sec. But Matea says to your first question, honestly, 
The first thing I think is, oh crap, another area where I need to start from scratch and learn a lot of things. When I started my online business, I had to learn about email marketing, sales, funnels, running a group, you know, it all. Now I'm thinking how much do I need to learn about podcasts so I can be at least good at it and how much time I need to invest. That's a really good one. That is. If you have a producer, Jessica can attest to this. If you have a producer, it's literally get on Zoom, talk for however long, put it in Dropbox, forget it exists. I do literally nothing. Like, if, honestly, I, I talk and that's it. If you want to bootstrap, you're going to be looking at how to set up your host, how to edit, you know, um, again, if you're not audio inclined, there's going to be things there where you're just going to completely miss. Not to scare you, you can learn it all, but the learning curve is steep. Making a functional podcast, I'd say it takes about a month to learn everything if you're fairly tech savvy. I know people who have been researching and learning for a year and still haven't launched. However, you're only going to be able to hit a certain plateau based on your level of audio quality knowledge. So if you don't know decibels, if you don't know Hertz, if you don't know things like that, your show quality will be dwarfed by the people who do. And since podcasting is an audio only medium, you really lean heavily on audio, right? Mm -hmm. Content and audio quality are, are the two parties that are always at war. You'll, you'll never lose a content junkie by having amazing audio, but you will lose an audio file by having garbage audio, no matter how good your content is. So it's good to, to learn audio. And again, if that's something where you know you want a podcast, but you really don't want to put the time into learning all this stuff, hire a producer, provide the content, and they will make you sound like gold on the other end. Yeah, that's literally what I do. Um, and I don't sound <laughs> like Minnie Mouse on crack, so whoop, whoop. Uh, that's the way we go. Which is funny because I don't doctor your voice at all. So that is your natural voice that comes out. It's the placebo effect. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> um, so in terms of, guys, what, what have you heard about podcasts that, you'll, that makes you question, oh, do I, should I start a podcast? Like, what have you heard? My thing was, um, and Heather has said this as well, that they can't be monetized, you know? And I was like, oh, okay, interesting. I see a lot of big podcasters, JLD, Pat Flynn, you know, Ali Brown, who is, I'm, I'm her diehard podcast fan. Like I freaking love her podcast. And, you know, for me, I was like, all of these people are making money from a podcast, but I'm seeing a lot of people. And this is like the online business world, right? I see a lot of people in the online business world who are making money. And equally, I see a lot of people in the online business world who are not making money. So I, I think it's kind of that thing. But I really heard, you know, they can't be monetized. You have to work really hard to get a sponsor. The only way to monetize them is to get a sponsor. It's really hard to build your audience with a podcast was another thing that I heard. Um, and that you have to be really techy to start a podcast. Like, and again, <clears throat> that tech is, is a real big thing for me. So Heather has said that too, that they can't be monetized. Um, the other Heather, we have two Heathers. Yay. Oh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Who am I talking to? <laughs> the troublemakers of the group. Um, but the other Heather says being able to connect with the audience is a big reason why I want to start, you know, being able to connect properly. Um, we're going to come back. There's a couple of questions around what's the cost of the producer and things. Uh, Susan Jane Rome, uh, the general format of interviewing. I prefer just chatting. Love that Jess break that mold. Ah, thanks. Um, and that it's tricky to dual record for hot seat or coaching. Um, Heather, I also heard it was too late to start one, that the ship had sailed. So that the podcast okay. ship was out to sea. So first of all, yes, you can monetize. However, a lot of people are closed minded when it comes to the monetization portion. They think that a sponsor is the only way to go. Last I checked, I had 11 ways you could monetize a show. I'm not going to give them all here, but the fastest way to cash in on your podcast is to use it as a marketing tool for your current business. Talk about what you do on your show because then people will listen to your show, realize you know your stuff, buy into you. That is honestly the fastest way to use your podcast to generate cash flow. But there is sponsorship. It does happen. You need a fairly strong listenership to do it and do it well. But my first sponsor came with 180 listens my very first month. 
I had a local guy. Uh, I, I sent out a bunch of emails because I was new to the industry and I didn't have preconceptions about it. So I didn't even know there was a CPM model out there. And I was just like, I want sponsors. So I wrote a bunch of emails to local business people and a guy replied and he was like, yeah. Cause what I said is, you know, you get to be part of something up and coming. You get to, it's new and exciting. We're talking to millennials, all this stuff, you know, and, and it was a water conditioning company and they were like millennials, love, you know, they love taking showers and if they have hard water, it's not going to be good in their hair. Like, so we started coming up with like ads and stuff, but that person signed and I bought my first studio equipment. Cause when I started, okay, I had a karaoke mic and an eight year old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A karaoke mic that my co-host and I handed back and forth one mic for two people and an eight year old desktop that like squeaked when it ran. Okay. <laughs> so we started with nothing and we got our first sponsor a month in. We only had 180 people tune in and they, he was like, yeah. So he gave us a couple hundred bucks and we bought mics, a mixer, a new computer, you know, that kind of thing. Then our town heard our show and put us on the radio because we had a positive message. That sponsor was running ads on a, comp a competing radio station. We were his loophole to get on the other radio station. So he oh. pumped a bunch more money into us. So, I mean, as long as you have an imagination, a way to frame it, some relationships that, you know, you think people could, for instance, there's a lot of these business in a box things coming out right now, mm -hmm. right? Contact one of them. Say you have a business podcast, say that you're just starting out. Your listenership is growing you know, maybe charge a little less per episode, you can be sponsored straight out the gate. There's no reason you can't be. It's just, it depends. What are you willing to give to the sponsor in exchange for getting their message to your audience? Right. Um, if so, it might, a lot of people think it's just, I'm going to run a commercial for 30 seconds and you're going to pay me. No, you can sweeten the pot much more than that. Do they need leads? Do you have access to those leads? You know, do they, I don't know. It, it's really like, I wrote a whole report on it and I'm drawing a blank right now. Can you, but like, can, you, can you put that report in here? Because genuinely, I mean, throw up some um, heart emojis if you would like to see a report, like a free report on how 11 ways to monetize your podcast. Like I'm all over this, you know, <laughs> I, I want to know because ultimately, and, and this is the thing guys, right? We, we do this, we do content creation. People are throwing up all the hearts. Um, we, we create content and we, we spend our time on social media platforms doing the stuff we do because ultimately in order to make an impact on the world, in order to leave your legacy and do all of that good stuff, you also have to make an income. Without an income, there is no impact, right? We've talked about this in here this year. One of the biggest things that has come up for this group this year is that wealthy women are going to change the world. Women who have money and indeed people who have money are going to be able to go out there and create the impact that they want. So when you are creating content for any platform, you need to know how to monetize it, right? It's yeah. nothing to be ashamed of. I'm like, no. yeah, I love my podcast. I friggin' love it. And I do it every day and I record it and and I love it when I get an email from someone who's like, Jess, that really resonated with me and it's great. Also, I love being able to donate 50% of my money to charity every month because for me, that's a big deal. And if I can monetize a content stream in my business, of course I'm going to because the mm -hmm. money that I generate from that goes directly to helping somebody less fortunate than me, right? Yeah. And like I avoid sponsorship because I don't want to run commercials on my show. I don't like commercials. I think they suck because people are in it for the content, not the commercials. Right. So um, I use, again, like I use my show as a, a platform to talk about what it is that I do for people who want podcasts, but I know people who use affiliate marketing. So, no. you know, I, one of my business coaches ran a, a program for six K Mm -hmm. He was offering 20% affiliate marketing. We would put a link in our show notes and anytime someone bought that, we'd make 1200 bucks, you know, like there's that there's uh, repurposing your content into info products. Like I said previously, there's merchandise. You yeah. can like put your load, there's tons of ways. Okay. It's just a lot of people are too closed minded or have heard that there's only one or two ways to do it. 
tons well, of waste. We want your report. So please, <laughs> please share that because we would love to see it. And I certainly would love to see it. Is there anything else that you want to ask us or that we can do for you? There, there was something else you had mentioned actually in the, in that list of questions that I can't, I'm drawing a blank on it. So I'm going to no. go back. Yeah. And... Have a look back in the comments and see what is around. Yeah. Um, but you... again, as far as producers go, I know someone was worried about the cost of producers. It, it varies. It really does. You'd have to contact a few, shop around, get examples of their work. Most mm-hmm. important thing you can do. I, I've been known to send out like my entire portfolio and be like, listen to all these. And if you like me, hire me. Right. So like, it's very important to get in and, and, and listen to what it is they produce. But overall, I'm just excited to go in and, and kind of start dialogues with, with some of your, your people and just see if I can kind of go on to an individual basis and chat and solve any problems and clear up any myths because podcasting is surrounded by false information, tons of it. And so if I can clear some of that up and help someone make the decision for or against, I'm happy to. <laughs> and I think, and this is the thing, right? You know, we've been talking a lot about integrity in here recently and about, you know, dispelling some of the myths in the industry. And genuinely, one of the things that, you know, one of the biggest reasons that I hired Scott, I got on the phone with Scott and I didn't know him from Adam. Okay. So I didn't know this guy and I was like rocked up to the call and I was like, I've just, you know, had a conversation with a, a podcast producer that wasn't as, as kind of fruitful as I'd hoped. And so when I turned up on the phone with Scott and he was like, oh, this is how you could plan your show and this is how you could do this, right? Scott basically ran the anti-discovery call with me, the anti-discovery call with me, right? We all know how like, I'm like, do not coach on discovery calls. Scott didn't do that. Scott literally sat there with, for an hour with me and was like, oh, you should be doing this and maybe think about this and maybe have this plan and think about how you can do X, Y, Z. And that was really helpful for me. Okay. Now, albeit I turned around to Scott and was like, I'm paying you for this time. Was I not like, you will take my money for this time. She was actually really aggressive about it. It intimidated me. (laughs) (laughs) Take my money. Shut up Um, and take my money. (laughs) It's that kind of thing, right? So, you know, if there is anybody in the industry that is going to give you the answers to your questions, it really will be Scott and he will do it in a genuine way. All right. So if you do have questions, if you catch the replay and you want to ask things, please make sure you tag me or you tag Scott in it so that we can come back and and have a conversation. All right. Scott's going to come in. He's going to give you the link to his free Facebook group, which is the podcast discovery center. And he also has podcast Bay, which is if you want to monetize your um, podcast, then you can join that group too. Um, But please, 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 you know, have conversations with him. If you are thinking of starting up a podcast and Scott, seriously, thank you so much. Cause I know that this was not your like, you, you were not jazzed about coming on video in a, in a room full of 1900 women. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was excited about it when I agreed. And then as I, like, when I woke up today, I was like, fuck. What did I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little bit scary, but has it or has it not been fun? It has been, it has been. I enjoyed myself a lot. And people are saying like, Heather says, this is fantastic, you know? So please guys, if you have questions about podcasts, make sure you get in touch with Scott. Everyone's saying it's really helpful. And if you have questions, you're watching the replay and you want to ask anything, please go ahead, like knock yourself yeah. out. And we yeah. will see you really soon. So thanks for joining. Yay! Like, I have no idea what I'm doing now. Oh yeah, I need to take this off. <laughs>